you talk mm -hmm. a lot about what you call vanity <laughs> metrics. Yes. Um, so there's a sort of vanity metrics, and then there's, I guess, sort of, I don't know, re, what do you call it? Real metrics. We call them something. actionable metrics, okay, actionable which, metrics, you know, okay. it's, it's not, as, not as catchy a phrase and So the vanity, vanity metrics, metrics are sort of, you know, number of users and all these things that people you see sort of touted on, <laughs> on you know, on, on TechCrunch or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, you know, and uh, um, sometimes those things matter. I mean, you know, uh, um, if you're a CPM-based business who gets paid on that, I guess that correlates to revenue or something. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But, but you know, you think a lot of times those things are used as a way to kind of delude people, or entrepreneurs absolutely. delude themselves into thinking they're successful when they actually aren't. Yeah, TechCrunch is absolutely ground zero for met vanity metrics disaster zone. Yeah. Um, and, and to their credit, they've been really interested in this question of how do we push companies to reveal more interesting, better metrics than vanity metrics. But the reason companies like to talk about vanity metrics is they both make your competitors feel bad about themselves and also reveal nothing about your business. That's, mm -hmm. that's why they're such a good strategic weapon. Yeah. Because like, if I say I have 100 million messages sent on my platform, or one of my favorites is the total GDP equivalent of all the user-to-user -user transactions on our platform is, and it's like you get these huge numbers. Yeah. How do you know if that's you know, 10 million people who all tried your product one time and are all about to churn out, or one guy with the most active web browser in the world? <laughs> yeah. You can't tell the difference. Yeah. And that's not just about hits and, and uh, you know, website stats. It's also basically about the way we do accounting to measure success. A lot of VCs have this problem. A lot of corporate CFOs have this problem. If you have an innovation team that you give a million dollars and they go off for a year and they come back a year later, what do we know for sure? We know for sure they spent the million dollars. Oh, money always gets spent. Yeah. Every time the report goes something like this. Listen, I know when we raised this money, we promised that we were going to have millions of users and you know, millions of dollars in revenue by this time, but actually we have hundreds of users and no revenue. But we've learned so much this past year. If you just give us another year, another year investors, so you get this pitch all yeah. the time, right? Just give us another year, another million dollars, we'll make it. Most, like if you look at the accounting metrics, ROI, profitability, everything we get trained to do as like a corporate CFO or VC, those metrics cannot tell the difference between that team that is on the brink of success or a team that spent that year goofing off. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we're not talking about measuring like fine-grained differences <clears throat> in performance. We're saying that the current metrics paradigm literally can't tell the difference between absolute success so and total disaster. So if I'm a VC disaster. and I have two companies come to me after, you know, for uh -huh. follow-on funding, and I look simply at um, unique visitors, um, you think I'm, I'm missing the key metrics? I think you're in really big trouble because if I know, as an entrepreneur and I've, and so what, what, this what should I look at then as an investor? Let's well, and let me explain why. Okay. If I know that that's what you're going to do, then I'm going to make sure that we get a big press you know, hit right before I come see you so that our numbers yes. spike up to the top. What we want to do is get the like X-ray vision. Yeah, but, you know, but smart VCs will like discount that or so. I don't know. You know sure. Like, well, so you, like, can, like, you, can, you can imagine. So there's an arms race between I try to find sources of traffic and numbers juicing that you don't discount. And so we go back and forth, okay. back and forth. I call it success theater, the energy that goes into making people think that you're being successful rather than time, energy you could put into serving customers. Okay. So what I think we want to do is look at the per customer data rather than the gross data. So things like per customer engagement, lifetime value of customer, cost of acquisition of a customer. And in the book, I identify three different kind of unit paradigms. economics is what we... We used yes. to call this, I don't know, but right or Yeah, that, yeah, it, it's all right. we want to look at the unit economics. It's just, it's, it's not always denominated in money. Since, okay, so fine. So, you know, right, so you want to be able to look at, metrics. Okay, fine, fine. I call them engines of growth because each okay. of them is a feedback loop okay. where new customers come from the actions of past customers. So it's a sustainable growth model. So in a paid engine of growth, it's unit economics. It's just okay. lifetime value compared to CPA. And that's like the Groupon model. You know, you're making exactly. $10 a user, you pay hopefully less and you make a profit. Right. In a viral business, New users come from the act actions of past users through direct viral infection. So what we want to look at is viral coefficient. Mm -hmm. And in what I call the engagement or sticky engine of growth, new users are themselves the old users coming back. So we have, we have a very high retention rate, you know, stick so you basically get at, compounded so you interest look at kind of growth. Kind of retention rate would be a key thing. And this mm -hmm. is also would be broken down by kind of cohort. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. And the um, cohorting is the key thing because it doesn't even matter what the so unit what economic. Is oh, sorry, yeah, to sorry. Avoid, just to avoid jargon, like is, or not to be <laughs> yeah. accused of jargon. What, no, is, no, no, what no, does sorry. cohort mean? Uh, cohorting is just a way of looking at metrics rather than looking at like all the people who paid us money today as a group. We want to look at the people who signed up as if they were like classes in a school. So, so it's time segmenting when they signed up. Yeah, or or based on some other variable, time okay. time it, segmenting. But is it usually like is that a simple it's, one to use? Like people exactly. that signed up in January. Exactly right. We okay. want to say how did the people in January perform compared to the people in so February? So people in January people in and how many? And then and then the key things you look at is the retention. So how many people that signed up in January came back in February? Is that right? 
Well, if we're in a retention engagement based yeah, business, yes. Yeah, I'm talking about like, exactly like, right. let's say, right, we're talking about sort of the consumer viral businesses here, not the Groupon unit of paid. I'm just trying to. Uh, the reason I'm trying to be, I'll be a little bit pedantic about it is I yeah. actually think paid viral and engagement are three different models. Okay. Uh, and so. I, it's very, kind of a technical argument in the book. Okay, so why, I understand but, what paid is. Paid is yeah. Netflix, paid is Groupon. You, you're buying a user you're buying customers, and you're yeah. making more off of them mm -hmm, on the other mm -hmm. end. Um, um, viral, I think I understand, yeah. which is, you know, Facebook, I invite my friend as high cook, you know, yeah. presumably they have high retention as well. Exactly right. So, so sticky is, engagement are products that have extremely high retention. So think about a network effects business or an addictive. they don't have virality? Or? They don't necessarily have virality. Okay. I like World of they Warcraft don't. as the canonical one. World of Warcraft does so not have So there's no virality, virality in the, built into the product. Of course, right. there's, word, there's of word of mouth. There's word of mouth. Yeah. So word not, of mouth growth normally... Which is normally, different than product virality, right? Exactly, is, okay. exactly. So word of mouth growth is normally only linear growth. You know, okay. it's like a few percentage points per period. That doesn't normally lead to super linear results unless you can get the interest rate to compound. So mm -hmm. if you have close to 100% retention, then a 5% per period uh, retention rate... Imagine if you had a bank account that paid you 5% interest per month. You know, you'd be pretty psyched. Yeah. And so you can get super linear growth on a business like World of Warcraft, even though there's no virality. And the reason why these distinctions matter is that entrepreneurs need to focus on just the few key actionable metrics that matter to their business. If I'm World of Warcraft, have you ever noticed World of Warcraft has like the worst new user experience ever? Like you buy the box, you install the CD, oh, no, it takes it, forever. It literally it's like, took me five hours to get the thing installed. Right, like, it's unbelievable. So like normally we would say first time user experience is usability, so important, most important thing in the world. But the Blizzard guys are not stupid. They don't believe that. They understand that they have the product as addic addictive. People will go through the horrible user experience to get to the addictive result. So they have to focus on a product that make it as addictive as possible. But like, think about a product like a dating product. You're building, building Match.com. If you have long-term retention of your customers, your product sucks because customers want to get off of your product because yeah. they don't. So like, the engine of growth that's available to you is really different depending on the kind of business that you're in. Mm -hmm. And once you understand and make that kind of decision about which one you want to try to pursue, then we can say these are the couple, the, the critical few key metrics that matter for you. So do you think, I guess it sounds like for the first problem would be that, according to your um, framework, that a lot of startups don't even know which of the three they are. That's right. I mean, they usually want to do all three. Yeah. And they're like, why not? You know, what, what's, what's the so harm? First you decide which focus. one you are, and then you decide what are the important actionable metrics. Is that right? Exactly right. And so if you take a case like, think about the, the pivot from Odeo to Twitter. Mm -hmm. I wasn't there, but I've heard from several people that at the time that they made the pivot from Odeo to Twitter, they were so embarrassed about the fact that Twitter only had a couple hundred users on it. Like the vanity metrics were so low, they actually went to their investors and offered to give them their money back. Mm -hmm. And several investors who I've talked to like now regret having made the billion dollar mistake of having said yes. And I think it's really interesting about that moment is that based on the vanity metrics, you couldn't tell anything about how excited, like what was going on with Twitter. But if you looked at the per user, the actionable metrics for an engagement-based business, the engagement of those few hundred users was off the charts. So there was a signal there. It just requires some x-ray vision to actually go look at the correct thing. And I, I feel bad for the investors that made that choice. I think a lot of us who are investors or stakeholders in startups are all being forced to make those decisions without the key information that we need.